Section 3.5, Transformations of Functions. In this section, we are going to compare and contrast six different kinds of transformations on functions. I would suggest as a study tip, as you go through, to make a note of each of these and what it is we say about them. We're going to all be written in function notation. For a review of function notation, you might check out section 3.1 if that causes issues for you. The first type of transformation we have is the vertical shift. Given a function f of x, a new function g of x equals f of x plus k, where k is a constant, is a vertical shift of the function f of x. All the output values change by k units. If k is negative, then the graph will shift down. You can see here we have our outputs here. Our output values are added by whatever that value is. Again, if it's positive, they will increase. If it's negative, they will decrease. So example one, to regulate temperature in a green building, airflow vents near the roof open and close throughout the day. The figure shows the area of open vents in square feet throughout the day in hours after midnight tea. During the summer, the facilities manager decides to help to try to better regulate temperature by increasing the amount of open vents by 20 square feet throughout the day. Sketch a graph of this new function. So because we are altering the value v, because we're altering v, go ahead and write a function for the summer, s of t equals the regular amount of vents. We are increasing that amount by 20 square feet. So v of t plus 20. To sketch this graph, to estimate that 20 is about here, so we're increasing that by 20. We're going to increase up here about 20. And try to draw that parallel. Stay parallel here. And increase that by 20 as well. So all of our outputs, our y values, have increased, in this case v values, but they've increased by 20. They've shifted up. Another way to think about this is from a table. Okay, so we're going to see lots of different representations of these as well. So a function f of x is given. Create a table for the function g of x equals f of x minus 3. Right, so for our x values, Again, we are only changing the outputs, so the inputs stay the same. But each of our outputs will decrease by 3. So 1 minus 3 is negative 2. 3 minus 3 is 0. 7 minus 3 is 4. And 11 minus 3 is 8. And so that function has now been shifted down by three units. The next type of transformation we have is the horizontal shift. If you notice here, g of x equals f of x minus h. What's changed is not the output, it's the input. Okay. Now this h value is a constant, and it's the horizontal shift. If it's positive, the graph will shift right. If it's negative, the graph will shift left. Now this one tends to go opposite of what you might think. So we're going to start with our graph okay, and see if we can make sense of that. Returning to our building flow, airflow figure in example one, suppose that in autumn the facilities manager decides that the original venting plan starts too late and he wants to begin the entire program two hours earlier. Sketch a graph of this function. Right. To shift it earlier actually means to shift it to the left. Right. So we're going to go, it's going to remain here, but it's going to start increasing two hours earlier. Okay. So if it starts two hours earlier, that should still be parallel. something like this, that is shifting it to the left. 
that means our h value is negative. So the way I'm going to write this, okay, and I'm going to use f of t to be the autumn. Okay, actually, we'll use a of t for autumn. And f of t, no, not f of t, v of t for our original. There we go. I don't know why I want to keep using f of t. All right, that is our original. So v of t, or rather a of t, is shifted from v of t. Now using that notation f of x minus h, this is going to be t minus, now our h is shifted, shifting to the left, so we are going to have a negative h fitting in that form. Our h value is negative 2. So the way we want to write that is v of t plus 2. So having a t plus 2 moves it to the left. The, like I said, this tends to throw people for a little loop because it seems opposite. However, it actually makes sense. The h value, there's, there's automatically, there is in our definition here, a minus sign. So if h is negative, then we have, then have a plus. If h is positive, then it's a minus still. And this also makes sense based on the shifting of some of our points. So on this next problem, we want to consider some points, or two problems. Example 4 has a function f of x in a table. Create a table for the function g of x equals f of x minus 3. Right. Let's go ahead and work with that. So our outputs are not going to change in this case. 1, 3, 7, 11. What's going to change will be our inputs. Each of our inputs, okay, because we have a minus 3 here, because we have a minus 3 here, that is a right 3 units shift. Okay, we are shifted 3 units to the right. What that will do is actually increase our x values. So we'll add 3 to each of these, so we have 5, 1 is a point, 7, 3 is a point, 9, 7 is a point, and 11, 11 is a point. So shifting to the right will increase our x values, shifting to the left will decrease our x values. So notice from this I should probably go ahead and say that is h equals 3. That's how I'm seeing that. My h equals 3. All right, example 5. Figure below shows a transformation of f of x equals x squared. Relate this new function g of x to f of x. And then find the formula for f of x. All right. So this function is g of x. And the way that this is shifted, okay, this is g of x is f of x minus 2. Minus 2 because it is shifted to the right 2. So we're going to shift to the right 2 units. Because we know what f of x is, that is x squared, this is equal to x minus 2 squared. Now, how this makes sense is consider a point. Okay, let's consider the point 0, 0. We know that the toolkit function x squared has the point 0, 0 as a solution. Okay, that makes that equation true. For x minus 2 squared, okay, the point 2, 0 makes that true. x minus 2, so 2 minus 2 squared, that is 0. So 
having a minus 2 there shifts that, that point, 0, 0. So if we considered this point right here, having an x minus 2 shifts it to the right, and similarly with shifting to the left. So keep that in mind as far as what's going on. It seems in the reverse of what it that common sense would say. However, it makes perfect sense when you consider especially solutions to these equations. Alright, example 6. The function g of m gives the number of gallons of gas required to drive m miles. Interpret g of m pl plus 10 and g of m plus 10. The parentheses, the quantity is what's changing there. So g of m is the number of gallons of gas. So this is 10 more gallons of gas. Ten more gallons. Well, this appears to be ten more miles. Okay, so, but if we think back, m plus ten actually means we're shifting to the left, so that's actually ten less miles. So if we have this, so we have a different amount of gas because we can only go, we can go ten less miles. And that's how we want to tie those two together. Right, example seven: Given f of x equals absolute value of x, that toolkit function for the absolute value, sketch the graph h of x equals f of x plus one minus three. All right. I'm going to sketch a few things here first. Okay, first, the absolute value of x toolkit function begins in that way. f of x plus 1, that's my inputs changing, and that is going to move my function to the left one unit. All right. Now also notice that minus 3 will shift my function down. We'll shift my function down three units. So what I end up with is a function that begins as the absolute value of x, shifted to the left one and down three units. Which puts my vertex left one down three, right there. And then the absolute value function has a slope of one to the right and negative one to the left. So we have something that looks like that. So there is a sketch of our function. Next, we want to write a formula from our graph. And based on the graph, this appears to be our toolkit function, a transformation at least of the square root of x. Now, this function appears to be shifted to the right one. Right one and up up 2. So that would be f of x minus 1, that would move it to the right one, and then up 2, plus 2, which means I'm going to go ahead and write g of x g of x or actually this is labeled h of x, we'll go with that, is the square root of x minus 1 plus 2. Now notice the change that happens in our domain. The domain of our toolkit function is x is, actually we'll write that interval notation, 0 to infinity, and our range is also 0 to infinity. This function, the domain is 1 to infinity, 
the domain, all the x values, the inputs, are shifted to the right one. And our range values are from 2 to positive infinity. Our outputs have been shifted up 2 based on our graph. Right, the next type of transformation we have is g of x equals negative f of x and then also we have g of x equals f of negative x. The placement of that minus sign changes everything. Negative f of x is a vertical reflection. That is, the y values, the output values, are flipped across the x-axis. And g of negative x is reflecting about the y-axis because the inputs are what's changing. Okay, that makes it, hopefully should make some sense. So if we have functions and we want to write or graph them f reflected vertically and horizontally, we have this little how-to box. Okay, but let's just reason through this. You can pause and come back to that if you'd like. So reflect the graph, graph g s of t equals the square root of t vertically and horizontally. To begin with, I want to start with just the square root of t. The square root of 4 is 2. So the square root function is right there. Now negative square root of t is going to take my y values, my output values, and reflect them across the x-axis. So I'll start here, and each of my output values is reflected, and so that is a vertical reflection. Okay. Now here we have s of negative t, which is the square root of minus t. That is going to take my original function and reflect it across the y-axis for a horizontal reflection. 0, 0 stays put, but all of my y values, my output values, are what change there. All right, for our next example, I want to look at a table and determine reflections. So part A is going to have us take x and find g of x. Now g of x is negative f of x, so in that case our inputs remain the same. However, our outputs are multiplied by negative 1. So negative 1, negative 3, negative 7, negative 11. Now for part b, f of negative x f of negative x, what's going to change are inputs. Our inputs are being multiplied by negative 1. So drawing this up again, our outputs remain the same, 1, 3, 7, 11, and our inputs become negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, and negative 8. Alright, number 11. A common model for learning has an equation similar to k of t equals negative 2 to the negative t plus 1, where k is the percentage of mastery that can be achieved after t practice sessions. This is a transformation of f of t equals 2 to the t, shown below, and we want to sketch a graph of k of t. Now I want to reflect these bits one at a time. So first we have a horizontal reflection, Okay, that is our 2 to the negative t. A horizontal reflection would go this way. It will approach there. Now we have 1, 2, so it's negative 1, 2. Okay, and we'll just sketch that. Okay, there's 2 to the negative t. Now for negative 2 to the negative t, we'll take our new function, 2 to the negative t, and we'll reflect it vertically. So that point will start here. That will start here. Okay. 
Now, for our final function, negative 2, and we'll go ahead and call this k of t, negative 2 to the negative t plus 1, we will shift it up 1. So shifting those values up 1, Oh, actually, that is a little too out there. It should approach 1. There we go. And there's k of t. If you notice, the more practice sessions that occur, the closer to 1, that is 100% comprehension in the learning. Keep that in mind. The next thing we have is something called an even versus an odd function. And if you notice, f of x equals ne f of negative x. That is, a horizontal reflection does not change anything. That means it's symmetric about the y-axis. Horizontal reflection changes nothing with, when, with an even function. And with an odd function, we have two ways to say this, and I prefer the second but f of x equals negative f of negative x, or f of negative x equals negative f of x. The second version of that allows you to see that a horizontal and a vertical reflection actually perform the same thing if this function is odd. Okay, So we will actually use these statements to show if a function is even or odd. Let's go ahead and take this next function f of x equals x cubed plus 2x, even, odd, or neither. If you notice, the first thing we wrote for even functions and the second one for odd functions both involve an f of negative x. So what we want to do is consider f of negative x. Okay. If that equals f of x, the original function, then that is even if if f of negative x try that again equals negative f of x then the function is odd so let's consider f of negative x f of negative x will be our input is now negative x plus 2 times negative x. That is negative x cubed minus 2x. Now, I notice that if you factor a negative out of that, you get negative f of x. There's our original function. So f of x, f of negative x equals negative f of x which would indicate that this is odd. So a vertical and a horizontal reflection actually produce the same graph with that function. And of course you can graph that to find out. You can inspect that. All right, the next transformation type we have are vertical stretches and compressions. Okay. The way we write that is g of x equals a times f of x, where a is a constant. If that number is greater than 1, it stretches it. It increases the outputs. If it's less than 1, then it shrinks or it compresses the outputs, decreasing them. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at an example with this. A function p of t models the population of fruit flies. Graph shown here. And a scientist is comparing this population to another population, Q, whose growth follows the same pattern but twice as large. Sketch a graph of this population. So that would mean Q of t, if they are twice as large, if they are twice as large compared to P of t, then that is 2 times P of t. So if we take those point by point, Instead of having 0, 1, we have 0, 2. 3, 3 will be 3, 6. So we have a curve 
between those two. 6, 2 would be 6, 4. And then 7, 0 would actually be 7, which is right here. So let's have that decrease sharply. And that would be a sketch of the graph of that population Q of T because they have are twice as large. All of our outputs are twice as large. Right. Example 14, we want to create a table of this. Notice G of X equals F 1 half times F of X. So we are multiplying our outputs by 1 half. So 1 half, 3 halves, 7 halves, and 11 halves. Now let's talk about a graph here. We have the graph g of x, and we want to compare it to the graph or the function f of x. We want to find a formula for g of x. If I look at a couple of points, one thing I notice is I have this point 2, 2. The original function, x cubed, has a function 2, 8. Okay, so we have f of x and g of x as a point 2, 2. This is not shifted left or right, or up or down. Um, so we're only talking about stretches and compressions at this point. It appears that g of x, g of x is four times smaller. It's a fourth of that size. So it seems to me that g of x is one-fourth times f of x. And since f of x is x cubed, that means g of x is one-fourth x cubed. All right, the last type we are going to discuss of transformation is horizontal stretches and compressions. All right, notice this one is g of x equals f of b x, where b is a constant. If b is greater than 1, then the graph is compressed by 1 over b. If it's less than 1, then it's stretched by 1 over b. This is similar but reverse from our vertical stretches and compressions. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so suppose a scientist is comparing a population of fruit flies to a population that progresses through its lifespan twice as fast as the original population. In other words, the new population, R, will progress in one hour the same amount as the population, the original population does in two hours. And in two hours, it will progress as much as the original did in four. And sketch a graph. All right. So the new population at one hour is the same as the original population in two hours. The new population in two hours is the same as the original population in four hours. If you notice, the x values here are varying by a multiple of two. All right, so in general, we can say that r of t equals p of 2t. All right, now based on our statement we have there, we have a b value that is greater than 1. So our graph is compressed by 1 half. Okay, compression by a factor of one half. That means this is a horizontal shrink and each of our points is going to shift by a factor of one half. All right, so the point zero one will stay at zero one. The point 
let's see here, we've got the point 32 will be now at okay all of our x values are having okay so zero so where we are at two is now at one where we are at four is now at two so we move that point over that way where we are at six is now at three and there we're at seven is now at three and a half. So we actually have a graph that looks something like that. That entire graph is scaled one half the distance towards the y-axis. Right, next, let's look at this table. We want to create a table for the function g of x equals f of one half x. Okay. So again, our x values, our inputs, are what's changing. So we'll leave these as one, three, seven, eleven. Now, because of this one half, this is a stretch. stretch by a factor of 2. So each of our x values are going to double. So this will now be 4, 8, 12, and 16. Next, we'll look at a graph talking about compression or stretching. So relate the graph g of x to f of x using the figure shown. All right, so it looks like g of x is a third closer, going from 6 to 2. So our x values are multiplying by one-third. Okay. Or, the uh, better way to say that is we are compressed by a factor of three. Compressed by a factor of three, which means g of x equals f of three x. And we can see that from a couple of those points, right? G of 2 and f of 6 are the same, right? So if nothing else, we can take one point or two points. See, the x values for our, or the inputs for our f function are three times larger than those of the g. So that's where the, the compression is coming in. All right, the last thing we're going to look at is a combination of several of our transformations. So first, we want to stretch vertically and then shift vertically if we have those changes, those A and the K. If we have horizontal, we want to stretch or shift horizontally and then stretch and this should be a f of x plus k. All right, so given this table, we want to create the function values for 2 f of 3x plus 1. So first, we'll start with the f of 3x. Because this is this is indicates a compression, so all of our x values, our inputs, will be sliced by a factor of three. So that'll be two, four, six, and eight. Okay, there's the f of three x. Now for two, I'm going to go ahead and make another table over here. 2f of 3x, we'll take 
the table we just completed, that we just drew, and modify that. Now our Y values, our outputs, are doubling here. So we'll keep our inputs, 2, 4, 6, 8, but our outputs will double. So we have 20, 28, 30, and then 34. Now for our next function, we've got 2f of 3x plus 1. So we're increasing our output values by 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and have x, and all of our inputs will stay the same. 2f of 3x plus 1. Increasing those, we have 21, 29, 31, and 35. And that is our final table. That is our final table. Now, for our last question in this section, use the graph of f of x to sh shown to sketch a graph of k of x, which is f of 1 half x plus 1 minus 3. Now, to see what kind of stretch, see we have the 1 half x, to see what kind of stretch we actually have, what the factor is, we're going to want to factor the one-half out there. And by factoring that out, we have x plus 2 and the minus 3. So this is stretched by a factor of 2 because of that one-half. Stretched by a factor of 2. Well, let's see. That will take 2, 0 to be 4, 0, and then we have negative 4, 0, and 0, 2 will stay put. Okay, so we have that semicircle stretched by a factor of 2. Then we have x plus 2, which indicates it will be shifted to the left 2, and down 3. So let's plot some points there. We'll take the point negative 4, 0, and that will be negative 6, 0, but then down 3, negative 6, negative 3. The point two, zero, or 0, 2 will move to the left, negative 2, 2, and then down 3, negative 2, negative 1. And then our point 4, 0, 2 to the left, so it's at 2, 0, down 3, 2, negative 3. And there is our semicircle based on those transformations of that graph. Now, as I pointed out at the very beginning, there are six different kinds of transformations, along with the even and odd thrown in there. So it would be a good idea to write these things down and keep them organized very well that way you can refer to what the definitions are and the equations and compare the two as necessary.